Hello everyone, welcome to the Renaissance. Uh, the term Renaissance means rebirth. Let me say that again. The term Renaissance means rebirth. Remember that. And this rebirth specifically refers to the rebirth of the classical learning of the Greeks. So go back and think of the golden age of Greece. Well, the Renaissance is a rebirth of all of that exciting time of celebrating the individual, of expansion in the arts, etc., etc. The Italian Renaissance began in Florence, Italy. Remember that too. Florence, home of the Renaissance. And the Renaissance later spread throughout the rest of Europe. Originally, the ideas of the Renaissance were more literary and scholarly than they were artistic, but soon the notion of an ever-widening human potential reached the arts, architecture, science, and really every other aspect of life. This great time of expansion did not come about overnight. It had been building for hundreds of years, as we saw with the last lecture. But after the relative stagnation of the Middle Ages, this extraordinary time in history burst forth throughout Europe. As a result, great works of art and architecture were created as masters worked to constantly hone and widen their skills. The Renaissance man, or I'll say woman, the Renaissance man or woman was a person who was versed in the innovations, styles, skills, techniques, and aesthetics of Greek and Latin classical art, philosophy, and literature. So in other words, the Renaissance, the Renaissance person was, was versed in this great celebration of the individual and of the potential of each person to have their own unique creative voice. This classical awakening was only a beginning as each generation built on the one before. And over about a period of about 200 years, from roughly the year 1400 to 1600, art and culture were forever changed. Let's talk about the origins. In the 1300s, as we looked at in the last lecture, Italy and the rest of Europe experienced a sort of expansion. People were beginning to recover from the devastating effects of the Black Plague, of the wars, of the religious and political upheaval, of the time of the Middle Ages. Many people began to question the ultimate authority of the church, and the Franciscan order, based on the teachings of St. Francis, began to have a wider influence. Unlike the extravagance of church officials such as Abbot Suget, St. Francis and his followers took a vow of simplicity. Also, he began to preach in the language of the people instead of in classic Latin. Thus, the teachings of the church were made much more accessible to those that were listening. While the God of the Middle Ages was a force to be feared, and life on earth was a trial to be endured, St. Francis talked of a God of love that existed within the natural world, not as separate from it. The painter Giotto, who worked around the year 1300, was actually a lay Franciscan monk, which meant that he and his wife had taken the vows of the order but that they could still live as husband and wife and raise a family. But he, his work reflects his, the influences of St. Francis. Compare the work above with the paintings of the Middle Ages and notice the foreshortening on the angel and the natural gestures and drapery. Although this is only a beginning of the loosening of the stiff forms of the Middle Ages, it's an important shift that would lie dormant for about a hundred years after Giotto's death. So Giotto does all this revolutionary stuff with the art, and then people kind of forget for a hundred years until a guy named Masaccio came along. But I want to back up and mention a term that I use in this uh, previous paragraph, and that is foreshortening. Look at the angel above right. Notice how the arms are coming towards the viewer. That's relatively new, and we're going to see more of that with this uh, audio lecture. So foreshortening is a vocabulary term, and I'll come back to it. Now, how did the Renaissance actually begin? It's considered that the Bronze Door competition held at the Florence Baptistry, which was part of the Florence Cathedral, was really the beginning of the Renaissance. Out of over 4,000 contestants, now, each were supposed to make a little panel for the door like this. And here's the door finished. Now, personally, 
I think it's a little busy, but at the time it was a very important competition. So as I said, out of 4,000 contestants, seven were chosen as semi-finalists. Each of the semi-finalists did uh, a single panel, uh, and it was supposed to depict the sacrifice of Isaac from the Old Testament, where God asked Isaac um, ask Abraham to sacrifice his son in order as a show of his faithfulness to God. And at the last minute he stopped in this sacrifice and it doesn't happen. So the winner was a 20-year-old artist named Lorenzo Caberti. There was another artist named Brunelleschi and he lost. He was, I believe he came in second or third place. Now Brunelleschi was so discouraged that he gave up sculpture forever which was really important because Brunelleschi went on to become one of the primary architects of the Renaissance and he invented something called linear perspective that we use to this day. Um, now what's interesting about Ghiberti is that he did design the door that we see here and this is an important work to remember but Ghiberti spent the rest of his life working on the Florence Baptistry so, you know, who really won that competition? Brunelleschi lost, but he went on. He got mad, he went to Rome, he came back, and he became one of the primary architects of the Renaissance. So I think therein lies a, a lesson. Whenever we lose at something, you know, you never know. Um, but anyway, back to this conversation. It was in the year 1401 and is widely considered to be the beginning of the Renaissance. So let's talk a little bit more about the Florence Cathedral um, with the dome and the baptistry. The baptistry is actually out in front. Let me see if I can show you. I believe it's right about here. Okay, And the dome, this is another very important thing that we'll talk about. So uh, after he lost, after Brunelleschi lost this competition for the doors, he took a trip to Rome with who other? None other than Donatello, the great sculptor. And they studied classical architecture together. When Brunelleschi returned, he was given the commission to make the dome of the cathedral, which is an octagon, like a stop sign, an eight-sided circle, and it spanned 140 feet, which is uh, considered the half of a length of a football field. So this is a big stinking dome. Okay, the interesting classical learning that was going on in the Renaissance gave rise to something called humanism. Human Ism, and this took the teachings of the Greek philosophers and expanded upon them. It also gave rise to an interesting practice called magnificence, and what this meant is that spreading great sums of money on public works of art and architecture was considered very virtuous. In other words, patrons poured large sums of money into art for the public good, and this was so um, helpful and really an important factor that led to the great innovations in art because when artists are well paid what are they going to do make more art because that let's talk about Brunelleschi again and this huge uh, dome because the great height of the ceiling he couldn't use timber supports to assist in the raising of the dome like we saw with the Pantheon so instead he created a structure that had a skeleton frame on the inside and a tile on the outside so that workers were able to attach a scaffolding to the skeleton as they worked their way up building it and then they reversed the procedure and dismantled the scaffolding on the way down as they added the tile roof you can look above and easily imagine that as they're going up they're making these sort of stairs they're building that into the roof as they go around and around the dome and then they begin to add the tile from the top down and they disassemble the stairs, add the tile, go down further, take them down. It's really smart, especially when you consider he's really doing this for about the first time. So now let's talk about Masaccio. About a hundred years after Giotto, this guy, Masaccio, began producing extraordinary work and it seems to really pick up where Giotto's work ended and take it so much further. He's really an exceptional artist. Now, when we look at these pictures, it's really important to remember that the sensitivity and the realistic portrayal are really being done here for the first time. And he's using the technique of fresco. 
So all of this is done with pigment spread out on wet plaster. In the piece to the left, you see there is a skeleton at the bottom, um, and above it, the skeleton, it reads, I was once as you are, and you shall be as I am. So in other words, let's, let's look further at this piece on the left. Um, again, that quote, I was once as you are, and you shall be as I am, written above the skeleton. That's basically ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And it's kind of timely, because Masaccio was only 27 when he died of a fever. But let's look further at this painting. Also, you're going to need to remember that this painting on the left was painted by Masaccio. Okay, it's called the Trinity, but what you really need to know is the artist. Now here's a th couple things to notice about this painting. Notice the kind of archway at the top. It looks like a Roman archway. That's called trom de lay, and it means to fool the eye. And it's the beginning of this artist playing with the new science of linear perspective, which means that the artist is adding depth to the work that they create. Now I also want you to notice the two figures at the right and the left below. Now these would be the patrons, the ones on the outside. That's who paid for the artwork. So they got to be painted in because they paid for it. Now in contrast to Masaccio, let's look at the work of his contemporary Fabriano. Fabriano also took an interest in depicting the figures more realistically, but he really loved the decoration and pattern. This is one version of a, of a classic theme called Adoration of the Magi, and this means that royalty is paying homage to the baby Jesus, like three wise men bringing their offerings. But what they would do is they would paint the patrons in as the three wise men, as the royalty. So this was a great way to paint the wealthy patrons into a religious painting and cover a bunch of bases at once. So this is repeated endlessly in the Renaissance. But what I want you to know here, to notice, is look at this incredible pattern. And also look at the little boy adjusting the spur of the king. I find that to be a nice touch. Now in the early part of the 1400s, so much great art poured out of Florence, Italy. And there's two main subjects for these paintings. The above is one by uh, Castano. And it's a painting that represents the classical Greek influence. It's the Simeon Sibyl, which means a wise woman, or, and one that influences men unconsciously. And to the left, we have another one by Piera della Francesca, which shows the religious influences. And obviously, this is the drunken apostles sleeping with the Christ figure standing over them. Now let's look at another art, a painting by Piero della Francesca. I just love this. There's a, a bunch of lessons to be learned in this painting. First, I would like you to notice how much more effective or visually attractive the guy on the right is compared to his wife. And look at the use of red, the dark hair, the contrasting with the background, and also his rather interesting nose. What a guy. So these two profiles show the shift that is beginning to occur in portraiture and that will be later developed by artists that are going to be coming. Notice how they're very individual looking, but they also look a bit stiff. And this is going to change dramatically over the next 50 years. Now also I want you to notice that the artist here is using atmospheric perspective, which means that the mountains get closer to the sky color as they recede. So notice the distant mountains. See how they're so much lighter than those, uh, that part of the landscape that is closer to the figures? Atmospheric perspective is a very important thing to, for artists to use when they're trying to depict death, um, depth of field in a painting. So let's talk about humanism. There was a school of thought called humanism that was really at the root of the great advances of the Renaissance. This term refers to the classical Greek revival, the notion that man is the measure of all things, as the ancient Greeks would say. In order to develop this human potential even further, schools were developed that reflected a curriculum de designed to further true human dignity. These schools developed the body as well as the mind. They encouraged innovation among the student population and they also educated girls as well as boys. 
Now we're going to end this slide lecture because I'm out of time, and we'll begin part two with humanism. Thanks for listening.